Welcome everyone. My name is Donna Oshry. I'm the Director of Marketing for the Wealth Campus for Senior Living. Uh, we're thrilled to present to you today our author series featuring uh, Bobby Lambert, who is here to discuss her new book, From Trauma to Healing, Seeking Solace and Safe Places to Fall. Um, before we start our program, I'm just going to take um, just a couple of minutes to say a few words about the Wolf Campus, um, in case you are not familiar um, with us. Um, the Wolf Campus for Senior Living uh, is a, a nonprofit senior community. We have been around for over 45 years. We are uh, a warm and inviting community that reflects Jewish values and traditions, but of course, we welcome people of all faiths. We provide the highest level of care and service um, that's based on respect and compassion. And our goal is always um, for our clients and our residents um, to provide a meaningful life, um, like I said, for our, our clients and residents. So you may have heard about some of our agencies um, and not known how they all connect perhaps, but as you can see, our campus offers um, a variety of services and programs uh, to the senior community. Um, I'll start with Stein Assisted Living. Uh, it's where our incredible staff combines a warm and inviting atmosphere with personalized and attentive care. We offer a home-like environment um, that includes social, fitness, educational activities to keep our residents happy and engaged. We have things like a beauty parlor, housekeeping. Uh, we have nurses on premises 24 hours, seven days a week, and they provide compassionate and professional care to our residents. We also offer respite or short-term stays where um, if you wanna come and try us out um, without the long-term commitment, or if you need a little help after a hospital stay for a short period of time, you could come for a two to four week period um, and enjoy all of our amenities without, like I said, um, the long-term commitment. Um, it really is a great way to try us out. And we also have a great memory care program. Um, if you'd like more information about that um, or any of the programs uh, at Stein Assisted Living or other programs, feel free to reach out to me. Um, Willen Senior Residence is our independent living building. It's a HUD building, so you do have to meet financial eligibility requirements to live there. Um, we offer spacious apartments. We have a social worker on staff for our residents, a beauty parlor. We have a convenience store that is run entirely by our residents. Um, and of course, housekeeping and, and much, much more. A very um, a great community. <clears throat> Sign Hospice provides compassionate end of life care. We focus on comfort and dignity of the patient, as well as support for their family. Uh, we're available 24-7, uh, and that's including evening and, evenings and weekends. And we provide care uh, wherever the patient is. So it may be at home, an assisted living facility, whether it's ours or another, nursing home, a hospital, wherever they might be. Uh, Wolf at Home, that's our home care agency. We provide care again, wherever the patient calls home. Um, we provide peace of mind and an individualized peer, uh, plan of care to meet our patient's needs. We offer um, skilled nursing, certified home health aides, non-medical companionship. And we also uh, offer pastoral and spiritual care. And through um, another one of our services, Wolf Transport, we are able to provide transportation services um, to our clients. And so Wolf Transport, um, like I said, we offer transportation services to seniors and individuals with special needs, um, not just to our agencies, but to the community. Um, we take people to medical appointments, dialysis, shopping trips, et cetera. All of our vehicles are ADA compliant and wheelchair accessible. And especially now with the pandemic, uh, a lot of people are worried about using public transportation. And so we offer a low cost alternative. And of course, we're taking all of the necessary precautions to keep our clients safe. Um, lastly, our education and resource center 
It's a beautiful building. Uh, it's where we hold a, uh, health, wellness, educational, social programs for the community, as well as continuing education programs for professionals. Um, it's where we would have held this program, um, but unfortunately, we're still not holding programs on our campus because of the pandemic. Um, but we do hope to welcome you there um, to uh, a program really soon, hopefully. <laughs> and so finally, I know you're all here for the program. So if you have any questions about any of our agencies, my contact information is on the screen and I will also put it into the chat. So you, you'll have it there. Um, so our author series, uh, it's sponsored by the Foundation of the Wolf Campus for Senior Living. It's dedicated by Cheryl and Michael Kaufman in memory of Michael's younger brother, Alexander Joseph Kaufman. We are thrilled to have Bobby Lambert with us today to discuss her book, uh, From Trauma to Healing, which is um, a really important topic. Um, and I'm looking forward to hearing uh, about it. Uh, if you haven't done so yet and wish to do so, you can purchase a signed copy of the book on our website. Uh, the link is on our screen. And again, I'll put it into the chat. Um, so Bobby, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll turn things over to you um, okay. for our presentation today. Okay, thank you very much. Now uh, I'm gonna share my sc screen and just bear with me for a minute to get this technologically right. It's not, it's not my, my strength and my forte. <laughs> thank you for being here and I am Bobby Lambert. I'm in the San Francisco Bay Area and I'm a native of San Francisco Cisco, and uh, with strong Jewish roots in, in the community. I am the co-founder of a company called Confidant Inc. Uh, it's a human resource consulting firm and we do our best to create harmony and prevent and manage disruptive workplace behavior, including uh, complex, challenging, and sometimes violent situations. I have a PhD and a master's degree in psychology and human behavior, and I've been working in this field for 35 years. During COVID, um, I had the opportunity to step back. Our work slowed down for the first time in a long time, and um, I took that opportunity to really reflect on um, and research and write, which is something I always wanted to do, to um, really remind myself and others of the resilience of human nature, which I've seen over and over again, and also to provide some tools and understanding of how to counterbalance the kind of fear and trauma um, that we've all experienced with hope, faith, and unconditional love. I want to make a bit of a disclaimer since I don't know the audience, and that is that trauma and discussing trauma can be triggering. Um, we're going to save our questions to the end, but in my book, I do share some experiences that I've had in my life that are shocking and, and traumatic. Um, won't be the whole presentation, but I'll be discussing a little bit of my story and reading a few pages from my book. Um, just to provide a foundational part of my story and my career. Hopefully you've not experienced the type of trauma that I have. However, hearing about trauma in general can bring up your own memories and traumatic experiences. So I just wanted to say that up front, not, not to scare anybody, but just, just to know that that can happen when you're talking about this subject. Um, and especially with the past two years of the pandemic. I mean, between the lockdowns, the separation from loved ones, illness and loss, and just everything that we've gone through, I really doubt that anybody has escaped <laughs> entirely. Um, I do encourage you to stay to the end of the presentation for these reasons, um, because I will be sharing practical tools along the way and. Um, for navigating difficult situations. And I'll leave time at the end for your questions and answers. So I'm in questions and give you answers, but um, hopefully you'll hang in there with me. Um, I'd like to start by defining trauma as I've 
come to know it over the years. Lots of different definitions out there, but this is how I look at it. And that little graphic that you see, that's what happens in our psyche and our minds when we undergo a trauma. There's sort of the splitting that takes place and the traumatized self is where um, we hold the trauma. Sometimes some of us put it away, don't deal with it once we're out of it. Um, and there's a survival self that influences the way we get out of a traumatic situation, but also inf influences the different decisions and choices that we end up making in, in our life. Um, the healthy self is the other part. And the good news is that's always preserved, which is important to know. We can go, go back to that place. And of course, that's sort of the goal of where we all wanna live as much of the time as we possibly can. And from there, we can deal with it trauma and survival kind of issues. In terms of trauma or what I call the big T trauma are kind of deeply disturbing and dis distressing single events or a series of events. Um, they often result in physical injury and emotional shock. Examples of those are natural disasters, accidents, wars like we're seeing in the Ukraine right now, uh, violence, sexual assaults, and the COVID pandemic definitely falls squarely into this category of a, a big T, although it's impacted um, everybody in, in different ways. But what happens and what's common to all of these is that we lose our sense of safety, which is our most basic biologic need. Um, trauma is also defined as repetitive, ongoing psychological and emotional injury, where there's not necessarily any physical injury. But those are the kinds of traumas that we suffer at the hands sometimes of family members, intimate partners, or bullies at work or school. And somehow over time, these types of repetitive, repetitive trauma become part of our daily lives. And um, there's also a lesser known and often unconscious trauma that is inherited and passed on through generations that has the power to impact the roles we play and the bonds we share with others and the decision, decisions that we make in our present life. So it's really critical to understand all the ways that trauma impacts us so that we can genuinely make our moves towards that um, healthy mind. And there is a whole science I'm not gonna go into called epigenetics that's I think really interest, interesting being a Jew um, because it does show that the DNA, it, our DNA is impacted by the trauma of the Holocaust and those certain, you know, which is a surprise to people at times, but um, it, it is true and I've seen it at work in my um, own life. I'd like to share my big trauma with you and my journey from there. Uh, I'm gonna do a little bit of reading to you, but first I just wanna introduce you to my dad, um, Eddie. He was the son of Jewish, Jewish Russian immigrants who had um, six children and came to this country with nothing. Dad was an active member in the San Francisco Jewish community at Temple. He helped start the first Jewish golf club when membership in non-Jewish clubs was not possible. Um, and he was a major supporter of the statehood for Israel. He put himself through Cal Berkeley working as a stevedore on the docks and he um, was a powerful oar on the Cal crew team and even earned a block letter from the university. He met my mom at Berkeley and they married and settled in San Francisco and he became a very successful insurance agency, agent um, and executive. When I found myself with two young children and um, getting a divorce, I wanted to go back to school, but my dad said, no, you're gonna go to work for me and learn how to take care of yourself if I'm gonna help you. So that's what I did. And that picture of him sitting behind his desk with his cigar is something that I remember well. Um, and Eddie was kind of the saving grace in my life. I loved him very deeply and depended on his love and. Uh, solace that he provided to me 
um, in what was, I came to understand a very dysfunctional family. As the youngest of three children and as his favorite, I took a lot of grief from my siblings and my mother, but it was worth it in the end. He always called me his carbon copy and gave me the Star of David. I don't know if you can see it, but um, that I wear around my neck today. And that was an exact duplicate of the one that he wore on his watch fob. And when I was 32, suddenly everything changed in my life and I lost Eddie and my sense of safety. I'm gonna, if you'll indulge me, I'm just gonna read you a, a, just a couple of short pages from my, my book so that you understand uh, sort of where I had to come back from. I don't know how my life would have unfolded if my world had not been smashed into millions of tiny shards by a fusillade of gunfire that I didn't even hear. There are events that happen in your life that you will always remember and forever wish you could forget. There are events that take place that destroy your life as you know it and render what was unrecoverable. The belief system you utilize to understand the world you live in is turned inside out and upside down. Faith is demolished, religious beliefs fail you, support systems constructed to sustain you, let you down. Sanctuary no longer exists, there's no escape. Suddenly you're filled with terrifying thoughts and truths you can't escape. My big trauma started with a late night phone call, one of those calls you never want to receive. Eddie, my father, was a handsome man, six feet, four inches tall. He was healthy, fit, and successful. He was confident. He was also complex, as was our relationship with one another. He wore a a watch fob on a chain clipped to a belt loop on the waist of his custom tailored suit pants. His diamond star of David hung there too. Dad was a proud Jew, a huge supporter of the state of Israel. He was a son of Russian immigrants who fled their native country to avoid religious persecution and almost certain death. He suffered cruel acts of anti-Semitism growing up outside Portland, Oregon and never forgot. We worked together in his insurance business in San Francisco. Our offices at 50 Francisco Street were graced with magnificent water view of the San Francisco Bay. On Friday, November 19th, 1976, dad left the office at noon as he often did. It was a day before the annual big football game between Stanford and his alma mater, Cal Berkeley. I was the third generation of Cal attendees. My parents met there in the early 1930s and my great uncle, Rube Goldberg, a famous cartoonist graduated from there at the turn of the 20th century. As always that day, dad was upbeat when he was bound for 18 holes of golf, especially on the big game weekend. I kissed him on the cheek on his way out. We shared a long hug and promised to see each other for a family dinner that was scheduled for Sunday night. It was 10 p.m. on Saturday, November 20th, 1976, after Cal, Cal lost a close game to Stanford. According to a time-honored tradition, my parents attended the game, followed by a party given by my cousins. Upon returning home, my parents, as was their habit, clipped a leash to the collar of our black miniature poodle, Pepper. Dad closed the automatic garage door and they headed up Clay Street to the corner of Maple beginning of their usual route. I don't doubt that dad walked proudly straight and tall and unafraid, casting an impressive shadow on the sidewalk from the many street lights that illuminated their stroll. As my parents crossed Maple and turned to walk toward Washington, they couldn't know they would be rapidly intercepted by four dark and hooded figures. One of these young men, like the alpha in a pride of lions, darted out of the dark the others followed close behind. As my mother later described it, my parents were suddenly surrounded out of the pitch blackness and a hooded head that came with a hard voice of the leader, give up your money, you fucking old man, pardon the language. In the night, my parents couldn't see the weapon in his hand. My mother immediately retrieved her small evening bag 
from her coat pocket and found the few dollars within it, throwing them down on the sidewalk at his feet. One of the others snatched them up. My father moved forward to protest and protect my mother, but his motion was halted. He was thrown to the ground by the force of two bullets fired at close range. According to my mother, he was still conscious and breathing. Mom screamed and ran for help as the exhilarated pack sprinted away in the direction from which they'd come, excited and laughing. Pepper bolted for home, dragging his leash behind him. At that point, my mother ran up the stairs of the big brick house on the corner near the mailbox where dad lay bleeding. Although the lights in the house were on and the doctor and his family who lived there were home, they didn't respond to her repeated knocking or cries for help. In fact, mom later told me that she was so frantic that she kicked at their door with a heel of her shoe with all the force she could gather. She finally gave up and ran to the house across the street where she found help and access to a phone. She called the police and had an ambulance dispatched and then called me. When I put the receiver to my ear, it was my mother's voice quivering like I never heard it. And then without warning, she unleashed a torrent of words that stunned me to the point that I suddenly needed to swivel the kitchen chair around and sit down. Mom said, dad's been shot. He's lying on the sidewalk. She was hysterical. I was struggling to understand her, let alone absorb what she was saying. I tried to calm her down, but I couldn't. Through the, her tears, I could hear her say, they took dad away, but they wouldn't let me go with him. Dad was calling my name, begging me to leave, not to leave him alone. They told me it was a police matter and they were taking him to San Francisco General Hospital. Then she cried and said, honey, come get me right away. We need to go to your father. To this day, the memories of that night remain crystal clear. They roll through my mind like the familiar scenes of a movie on an endless loop that I can't stop. My father, Eddie, died later that night, and life as I knew it was over. A little drink of water still makes me emotional. It's hard um, to imagine the magnitude of the trauma of losing Eddie the way that I did. I lived the next year in a fog. I didn't know how I would pick up the pieces of my shattered life, but the path to recovery did begin to unfold. I moved out of San Francisco, entered grief counseling, and went back to school and gained two graduate degrees in psychology. I met a wonderful new friend and partner, Norm, who taught me the power of unconditional love and whose faith in me began to bring back my own faith in myself. I had the privilege of working with Norm in the healthcare arena during the AIDS epidemic in San Francisco and found comfort in helping others to grieve and recover and found my own healing really. I went on to become the national director of training and consulting at a company that provided mental health care to the employees of major corporations. And that company is now United Behavioral Health. Um, it was in this capacity in 1993, so some 17 years after my dad died, that I received a call that altered my life again. And this time it was from a San Francisco law firm. And since you're not from the Bay Area, you might not have heard of it, but it's called Pettit and Martin, and it was the 101 California Street shooting. When they called me, they had an active shooter in the building. And by the time the day ended, nine people were killed and six others were injured. And the shooter, who was a disgruntled ex-client, took his own life. It, I had no idea that the senseless murder of my father would somehow uniquely prepare me to assist these people that had suffered this big trauma on a large stage. And I have to tell you, I was nervous to talk to you tonight. I know this is a hard topic, but my partner Norm reminded me that the day after the shootings at 101 California Street, I faced 243 grieving people at a hotel um, to try to deal with and make sense and, and begin the healing process there. So 
you're a much e easier audience than, than that, but um, it is hard to speak about some of these things. But that, that night, it just all made sense to me. And as I was facing those people on that stage, I really felt like my father somehow had a hand um, in what would become a new career as a workplace violence expert and lead to the formation of Confidant Inc. I will say to you, since you're from New Jersey, I'm, I'm sure that you're familiar with Wegmans Food Markets. Um, shortly after the event at Pettit and Martin, I got a call from the head of the asset protection at Wegmans Food Markets, who said to me, workplace violence, we don't want it to happen here. Um, and that began a 20 year uh, engagement with us, um, working to help them prevent workplace violence. It's a wonderful company, wonderful store, and I'm sad we don't have it here, but it was the beginning of a, of a new career. Um, before I move on to much more positive things, I would like to tell you about a fellow named Lou, who's one of the survi survivors of Pettit and Martin, um, who I had the pleasure of seeing again as I was writing this book because I wanted to use his story. So let me just tell you a little about Lou and his path to recovery. Lou Ross had no way to prepare for the danger he would face on the 33rd floor of Pettit and Martin. He cheated death that day and lived to share his story. We spent many long hours working together in the months that followed the shootings. Unfortunately, over the years, Lou and I lost touch with each other as too often happens in my work. I connect deeply with unbelievably brave and courageous people in the midst of their most harrowing moments and then they fade away and we disappear from each other's lives. While writing this book, I sought to lo locate Lou in, in 2019. I wanted his permission to share his story. More than anything, I wanted to know how he was doing. I knew from my trauma work and personal life that what Lou went through was life altering. It would not only influence the rest of his life, but would always be with him like it happened yesterday. When I reached him by phone, our voices were overcome with emotion. It was as if the last 25 years had not passed at all. The gratitude that flowed from him touched me deeply. The fact that he was happily married and living in a remote, peaceful place made me smile. On the other side of fear, Lou found unconditional love that helped him heal. He found a safe place to fall. I hoped to learn how he was able to do that. Lou now had a mediation practice, he was an attorney, in a small town, helping the people in his community find peaceful resolution to differences. There were no high rise buildings, no crazed angry clients. Lou gave me permission to share his story and we made plans to see each other when he'd be visiting in the Bay Area. We had our reunion at a coffee shop near my home in Marin County. I found him sitting under the shade of a wonderful old oak tree sipping his coffee. I couldn't hold back my smile and neither could Lou. He stood up and, hu and we hugged each other. As we sat down, soft tears began to fall. Both of us were touched by the presence and survival of the other. Lou had made many changes and decisions in the years since the events at Pettin and Martin that marked his path to safety and healing. He recovered from his injuries, taking the time he needed, when he did return to work, it was a different environment in an area of the law that was less litigious and competitive. He was able to build a strong support system, confront old areas of dysfunction, and find an unconditionally loving woman who accepted him as he was with all his wounded parts. They were married and moved to a quieter place, living a life that they had chosen free from the dangerous streets of San Francisco. Lou was grateful for his new life. He and his wife took the time to travel around the world, a dream he always had. He didn't hide from his fears when they resurfaced, and he was able to balance the trauma with love, self-understanding, and time in nature. Lou had found a safe place, a safe environment, and a renewed appreciation for the gift of life. I can tell you that from my perspective, Lou made changes and decisions created a lifestyle and joined a community where he feels safe. He was, however, changed forever. And when you think about it, 
how could he not be? Why would a person want to remain unchanged after such a close call with death? We can't erase the traumas, but we can recover, move forward, and live meaningful lives. We can't we can seek out safe places to fall and find them. We can learn to trust and welcome unconditional love into our hearts. We can live the dreams we once abandoned. When you look back at your own life, would you say that you fear or welcome change, even when it's unexpected or caused by traumatic events? When a new opportunity comes your way, do you seize it or turn away from it? Remember, and it's important to remember, you have the power to choose and what you do next in this moment, with this day, with those you love, and in the years ahead. Thank you for listening to my story and Lou's story, at least part, parts of it. Um, and I, I would like to talk about safe places to fall. Um, and how I've come to define them. And it is in the safe places and with the safe people that I believe we find healing. And it sounds like from what Donna was saying at the beginning that, that the Wolf uh, Center and their services are doing what they can to, to do, do that for their community. I define safe places um, as where we go to understand, recover, and heal from trauma, that this can be an, an internal state of mind characterized by unconditional love for yourself, inner peace, balance, and strength. It's a place where we can be honest with ourselves and not afraid of, of who we are or what we are. And it's where we're able to express our deepest desires and enjoy our own company and laugh at ourselves. And we can do that in writing and journaling. I started journaling after my dad died. And if I hadn't started doing that, I probably wouldn't have been able to write the book. So I, I never knew where it would end, but I'm very glad for that. Um, and there are also safe relationships uh, that are our external relationships and characterized by unconditional love. And I make this distinction be between conditional and unconditional love because I, I found growing up in a Jewish family and with a lot of my friends that I grew up with that love in our families was pretty much conditional. It, you never knew when it was going to be given or taken away or what you might do that might cross a line to cause you to be rejected or in, in trouble. And um, it, it makes it pretty challenging. And it wasn't until I, I found unconditional love in my own life and learned to, to give it myself to, to others that I really was able to make this distinction between conditional and unconditional love. Um, in safe relationships, whether with friends or intimate partners or family members. In these relationships, we feel heard and we know what we have to say matters. We feel accepted and respected. We can be vulnerable and unafraid. It's that feeling of, I know you have your, my back. I know you're there for me. I know what to expect um, from you. And love flows unconditionally and consistently. And I know the older I get, as you can see from me now and the pictures you've seen before, it's, I'm, I'm well on my way and it's, it's glad to, I'm very, very grateful to have the comfort of unconditionally loving people in my life and a safe uh, place that I, I call home. Um, unfortunately, I don't go back to San Francisco anymore because it's not so safe anymore, it hasn't been for me for a really long time, but I live in the North Bay of San Francisco and and gratefully, it's a beautiful place. There are also physical locations where we feel safe and comfortable and calm and accepted and supported, like the site of the Golden Gate Bridge behind me. Um, for some, it's the ocean in the mountains by lake or in the high desert, uh, whether you're alone or in the company of safe people. 
And to me, safe places and those that we're able to create in our lives are the foundation from which we can face life's challenges. And no matter how profound, we know we can find our way back. And I think during COVID, um, it became clear to a lot of us whether we were in a safe place or what a safe place was to us and what safe people were to us. And I know that many of us are helped by the people around us and the places that we love. One more slide and then we can talk. You've been patiently listening and I appreciate it. I wanted to say a little bit about generational trauma because it, I was pretty shocked myself by the impact that it has. And I didn't know until um, after my mom passed away at 102, um, she went on to have a great life after my dad died eventually and, and uh, happy to, to say that, support that. Um, but it wasn't until after she died that I really started um, thinking about the past and, and my own generational inheritance and, and found that I really needed to make peace with the past. And in psychology, it's often said that we can't change what we don't know needs to be different. And that's why to me in my writing and in my work with other people and on my own journey, that self-discovery piece, that self-love and safe relationships are worthy goals to set as we move along the path from trauma to healing. Making peace with the past often uh, includes bowing to fate, to both the good and the bad things that have happened to us and opening to new possibilities and to a future of our own um, creation. And also, I've learned it's very important to face life with all due humility. And um, I think that's never been true, truer than in the last two years, just we finally got the mask mandates off and just to be out and about and not wearing a mask is an incredible freedom I never thought I would lose. Um, making peace with the past is critical in the healing process and accepting that what we can't change and that the facts of the circumstances that have come before us from our ancestors has already happened, but we can impact the future and future generations by the positive changes we make. And just as an example of um, family constellation or this inherited trauma that was developed by a German psychotherapist named Bert Hellinger, very, very great work. Um, in my family, there was this generation, generational dysfunction between mothers and daughters. Um, don't know if anybody's experienced that, but mothers and daughters always had a very difficult relationship. It was true with my grandmother, it was true with my great grandmother and myself and my daughter, where mothers and granddaughters were very close and very bonded, but mothers and daughters had challenges and were often jealous of the great relationships in the skip generation. And um, it's really been true in my family and kind of coming to peace with that and being able to talk to my granddaughter and to my daughter about that and kind of working that through has helped us kind of break that generational bond. I just want to um, talk a little bit about the tools that are up here and um, open it up to questions. I could spend quite some time talking about window of tolerance. Um, a lot of references to it on the internet if you want to look it up. But if you think about it, the window of tolerance is sort of the space. And again, that healthy mindset that we live in, the bigger it is, um, the more we are able to not take things in stride. We still get stressed, but um, the more we can handle whatever comes our way and make the changes that we need to, and it doesn't bother us so much. So expanding that window of tolerance uh, is critical. Self-soothing practices that aid healing, such as deep breathing and meditation. And I know people kind of get pushed away from meditation, but for me, it's just 
sitting quietly in the morning. We live uh, surrounded by open space and looking at the trees and just being quiet with myself or writing in my journal um, is sort of my meditation. Grounding exercises are really important and they're very simple, like breathing deeply or expanding your exhale or standing up when you've been sitting down or straight, straightening your posture when you're um, sitting, singing a song, playing music, calling a trusted friend. You know, all these things are very simple things, but they help kind of in psychology, they call it breaking set. So whatever, if your mindset is on the negative path and you do any of these simple things, they can break that set and um, make a difference to you. Giving and receiving unconditional love is critical. Sometimes we don't feel like we have a lot to give, but there's always someone in our lives that would benefit from a call from us or us reaching out in some way or an email or a text. Um, I don't like becoming so reliant on texting, but it happened with my kids and my grandkids <clears throat> during COVID a, a lot when we couldn't see each other. And now I'm kind of used to it, but reaching out when you'd like to have somebody reach out to you is always comes back, I think, in a positive way. And then finding that solace in safe places. And that may include counseling or joining a group, um, but doing, getting whatever kind of support really helps and assists you. I am open to your questions and I will stop sharing my screen, but, and I will give Donna, uh, a copy of my presentation if you'd like it. But I would just mention that at the end of my book, I have a reading list that you might want to explore to learn more about some of these topics I've barely touched. Um, and there are different types of uh, counseling groups and support that are available. So I just wanted to share that with you. So now I hope technologically, I'm gonna stop sharing. I see there's chat. Should I go to that? So oh, if, if anybody has questions, feel free to unmute yourself. You're all um, came into the chat muted. So you can either put your question into the chat or you can unmute yourself and feel free to ask your question. Quiet group. Questions? Yeah, quiet group today. <laughs> Bobby, I was wondering um, what you thought of the um, the latest stuff on the somatic experiencing and the healing of trauma. Um, I I I don't know a lot about it, so I'm going to be honest about that. But I do think that that it is helpful. I mean, I one of the things that I wanted to say is. Everybody's path to healing is different. I've found that the components are similar, but everybody has their own variation. So, you know, I, I recommend, you know, trying things and, and seeing what works for you. I mean, my granddaughter is doing her residency. She's a doctor already, but she's doing her residency in Indianapolis. But I mean, she, tells me about all kinds of things that they're learning and what's working and not working. So I just, I don't know a lot about it, Sharon. So I, I, I can't say, but if it's something that interests you, I would give it a try. Great, thank you. Any other questions? I um, am happy if you have any questions after you reflect on what I've said. I know it's a lot to take in, um, so I can understand the silence, the quiet, um, but I do encourage each of you to you know, talk to each other if you're watch this with someone else or take a little time to your, 
yourself um, and absorb this in whatever way you can. Gladys? Yes, um, I'm in private practice. And in the beginning of COVID in 2020, in the April timeframe, New Jersey was really hit hard, as was New York. And I lost several clients. Um, they died by themselves because no one could visit them, could be with them, could hold their hand, nothing. And to make matters worse, their the funeral homes and the crematories were so backed up that there was a wait list if you wanted to get your loved one cremated, which is what they were encouraging because um, in ground burials, there were a lot of issues with that. Having to deal with the loss of the clients and the fact that my clients and myself were helpless to be able to do anything to impact this was very, very difficult. And to this day, those families are, you know, they're, it's like a big gap that they have and yeah. they don't know how to fill it or fix it. And it's heartbreaking to see. I hope we never, ever have to experience something like that again. That was horrific. I don't know that the rest of the country has an appreciation for that. But during the early part of COVID, New York and New Jersey were, uh, there were refrigerated semis outside of hospitals with bodies just stacked up one on top of the other. And the funeral homes ran out of space in, in their they had to embalm all the bodies because that was the only way that they could um, keep them from, from further deteriorating. It was just, I, I never, ever thought I would see something like that in my life, given the technology that we have. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so sorry. And it's a great reminder. It's, it's interesting, you know, one of the, it doesn't compare at all to the losses that you're talking about, but my my dad's death was so sudden and I didn't have any time to be with him. And a friend of mine is now in Germany where she's from and her father is dying. And she wrote me the other day what she's been there for three weeks. And she just said what a gift it is to, you know, to be there with him and to give that comfort, you know, both for her and for him. And I, I do agree that that has been a huge tragedy of these people dying alone and the consequence of that on the people that that survive and I hope like you we never go through anything like this again thank you for sharing that anyone else I'm easy to talk to honest I've been told I'm a good listener I I do have um my website um, on the last slide. And if anybody wants to email me, you please feel free to, to do that. Do we have any other questions? Or just anybody that wants to share anything like, like Gladys just did. Mm -hmm. I mean, okay. it's, it's uh, important. I'm just. All right. Saying. Hello. Hello. I am Robin. Uh, yeah, uh, I was there for the whole thing at one of my places of employment, and it was it was awful. Yeah. It was more than awful. Yeah. But I also find that in our industry, as a social worker and, and therapist, I always find that there's not a lot of services for people of that are older, 40, 50, 60, 70, that the traumas around here, especially baby boomers, LBGTQ seniors, but there's very little services for them. And that becomes a bigger problem. They yeah. did the same thing during the AIDS crisis in New York in the eighties with the um, isolation. Yeah, I mean, I going through this pandemic had a lot of memories for, for me, the company Norm's company that I worked with was in the home healthcare field, and they gave um, at home services. It was Norm, uh, nurses and pharmacists that were delivering care because these people couldn't be in 
the hospital and they didn't know how to treat treat them and you know the emotional and psychological devastation is just is tremendous and like you're saying the isolation and I think that's why it's like one of my closest friends is someone I went to graduate school with and I I just think this is such an important time for all of us to you know seek out people we used to know know that feels safe to us or reach out you know because I think so many of us have have gone through the same things and even though I've dealt with all kinds of trauma I have to admit that I'm kind of at a loss um, as well because of the magnitude of of COVID and the multitude of ways that it um, struck different people in the holes like you like you are saying Robin of of in service and in in um, support for people so I wish I had some answers, but I, I'm still searching myself. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Let me share my screen one more time here. So I, I just want to, um, Thank you so much, uh, Bobby, for such an important conversation and um, very relevant topic, especially now. Um, I hope this was helpful, it certainly was to me. Um, so before I end things, I just want to um, remind you that if you would like to purchase um, a signed copy of Bobby's book, you can do so on our website. Um, the address is on the screen again. I'd like to also remind you to save the date for our next program in our author series. Um, that's going to be on May 11th. Um, very different topic. Um, very. David, David Page, um, we're, we try to do different topics um, of interest to people. Um, so David Page will be talking about his book, um, Food Americana. Um, if you know the Food Network show, uh, Diners, Dives, and Dives, I think I'm, Drive-Ins and Dives, I think I'm saying it right. Uh, David Page produced and created that show. So we're very excited for, to bring that program to you as well. So watch your email for registration information as we get close to that event. And um, lastly, I just want to tell you about um, another project that we're having on the Wolf campus. Um, if you would like to help support the Wolf Campus, we are currently running a paver campaign where you can purchase a paver which will be installed as part of our outdoors of a new outdoor space that we're creating for our residents and visitors to enjoy. It's going to be a beautiful space um, with a gazebo and benches um, and you can leave your lasting impression on our campus by dedicating a paver. Um, you can find more information about that on our website as well. So I just want to let you know about that. Uh, we just launched that um, a few weeks ago. So Bobby, thank you again. This was very, very informative and very important conversation, as I said. Um, and we really appreciate uh, you being with us tonight. Um, and thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if there are no more questions, uh, enjoy the rest of your evening. Thanks, Donna. Thank you.